Welcome to the Leah Andrews Show. I am very happy to have with us today Dr. Phil Garrison. He's an associate professor at Pacific College of Oriental Medicine for their doctoral program. He's also a scholar and practitioner of Chinese medicine. Welcome, Phil. Thanks, Leah. It's good to be here. Oh, good. Um, so today we're going to be discussing a topic that's really interesting for me, and that's Jing. Your, our essence, our, our innate vitality. It's really important for both lay people and for any practitioner of medicine, and especially Chinese medicine. So what does Jing mean to you as a scholar? <laughs> well, that's a really good question. And you know, when I was thinking about what to talk about, I think this is one of the biggest challenges. It's one of those terms that we hear so much those of us who practice Chinese medicine, you know, we hear Jing, Qi, Shen all the time. But Jing is a little bit tricky to pin down, I think. So I took a look at some texts. Um, the way that I like to teach in, in, in my scholarly way, hopefully, of explaining things is uh, we'll look at different conceptions of Jing. I think as any of your viewers who are familiar with Chinese medicine will know the most common translation of Jing is essence. Um, I think that's an okay translation, but one of the challenges I think that we face is how do we avoid cultural bias? We're obviously Westerners talking about Chinese medicine. How do we get at that notion of what Jing was when some of our core texts were written. Um, you know, I, I, I've seen other translations of Jing. Um, some people will take a very literal approach and translate it as um, semen or sperm uh, or, you know, seminal essence. I personally, I don't really like those translations. I think they're too narrow. Um, the other thing that, you know, modern practitioners like to associate with Jing is like DNA or genetic code. Um, and I think that's reasonable, um, the, the idea of DNA. But again, I would, I would say the concept of Jing goes a bit further than, you know, what we typically think of, um, you know, if we were to limit it only to DNA and genetic material, I'm sure based on your own studies, it, it gets an aspect of Jing, but not necessarily the whole thing. So when I discuss it, I'm primarily going to leave it untranslated, but I will give you our, and your viewers context from some of these uh, books, not only from Chinese medicine, but um, some of the books that are more philosophical. Um, so, so the first note about Jing that I pulled in is actually from chapter 49 of Guanza. And Guanza is a text that most historians date to toward the end of the Warring States period. Um, and I don't want to go too much into history, but those of your viewers who are familiar with Chinese history will know what that means. Um, so, so this is how the chapter 49 of Guanza describes Jing. And it says, the Jing of all things is that which brings them to life. It generates the five grains below and becomes the constellations and stars above. When flowing amid the heavens and earth, we call it ghostly and numinous. When stored in the chest of human beings, we call them sages. And I think that last line is something that really speaks to what, how Jing is mentioned in Chinese medicine, um, specifically in Suen chapter one, um, which of course, as you know, um, is one of the books of the Neijing, for, just for those viewers who may not know what Su Wen is. It's, there are two books of the Huangdi Neijing, otherwise known as the Yellow Emperor's classic on medicine. One is called the Su Wen, or Basic Questions. The other is Ling Shu, uh, which is sometimes translated as spiritual pivot or 
divine pivot, spiritual axis, things like that. Um, so that, that, that was the description from, from Guanza, which is a fairly early description. I thought it might be nice to start off with that mm -hmm. as, you know, a, a way of kind of getting some context. And I think too, what that kind of ties in is that all of these concepts like Qi and Shen, they're not just human. You're talking, there's a correlation in universal correlation. So I think that's another reason why it gets dangerous to, not dangerous, but not inaccurate to specify sperm or DNA or, or these very specific things. Right. Yes, indeed. Um, <laughs> so I thought the next place to go that would be useful to your to your viewers is Suan chapter one. Um, I know based on your own studies and what you've written, I, I know you're very familiar with this chapter. Um, it's it's one of the chapters of the Neijing that really focuses on on the nourishing life practices. And I think it's it's such a crucial such a crucial discussion for those of us who practice Chinese medicine, particularly in the West, um, where we're always two or three steps culturally divorced from 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 the like the essence of Chinese medicine, the even even the language, uh, the ability to access the text, read them in the original Chinese, is is a skill that not many practitioners in the West have. Um, those that can are are in the minority by and large, and and so many of us uh, are reliant on English translations and finding the best English translation. But Suan Chapter One, uh, I'm I'm actually about to teach in the doctoral program at PCOM in just a few weeks, so it's it's fresh on my mind. But one of the things that's so great about it is it tells us exactly how to assist our patients. Um, so that they can live a long and healthy lifestyle. Um, <laughs> the, the challenge of that, of course, is, well, the way to live a long and healthy lifestyle is somewhat challenging to, to do in our, in our modern age. And, you know, I, 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 I always love quoting from Suan chapter one, simply because if we take the, the general historical dating on it, and we assume it's written about 2,000 years ago, the idea that, that they were having these problems 2,000 years ago only underscores how, how much further from, from the Tao that, that, that we've gotten um, as, as a society. So um, I think Suan chapter one is the, is the first place to start. Um, and just to give a little background um, to, to kind of Bring us up to speed on on, on the section that we're going to focus on, or that that I chose as as something worth talking about. Suan Chapter One begins with sort of a very brief biography of Huang Di, who, of course, the, the book is named after. It's traditionally called translated as Yellow Emperor. Some people prefer Yellow Theark. Um, and this biography from that's in in Aging is just maybe four lines or so. And it's almost verbatim from a text called uh, Shiji, which is the records of the Grand Historian, which was also written during the Han Dynasty. And so it begins with just sort of a, hey, we named the book after the Yellow Emperor. This is who the guy was. And then we get right into a dialogue, which was very popular at the time that the Neijing was written, um, dialogues between Huang Di, the Yellow Emperor, and one of his advisors. So Huang Di asks, uh, one of his advisors, who here originally is identified as Tian Shi, which would mean either you know heavenly or celestial teacher. It's worth noting here that Tian Shi is the same name that um, uh, is is applied in Taoism. There's a particular sect that is associated with um, the uh, Longhushan, which is a mountain in China. Um, it translates to basically dragon tiger mountain. And the, the, it's sort of the hub for uh, Jungi, which is like Orthodox Taoism. And they refer to the person who um, sort of embodies the teachings, uh, the original teacher, and then through subsequent generations as Tian Shi, the celestial master, the celestial teacher. So it's interesting here because Huang Di's 
asking the celestial teacher these, these questions. And he's saying, back, you know, I'm going to paraphrase here just for, for, your, for your audience. Back in the day, the sages of antiquity lived these long lives. They lived to be 100 years old without getting tired, and they just sort of passed on without any drama. Um, without any disease. They lived out their allotted lifespan. What happened? What, how come people nowadays, meaning 2,000 years ago, don't do that anymore? And so uh, now Tian Shi is identified as Qi Bo, who is one of the major advisors to Guangdi throughout the Neijing. And he says that, that these ancient sages, they knew the Tao. They were familiar with the Tao. They modeled themselves on yin and yang. Which, of course, as as you know, as as your audience knows, yin and yang are are fundamental concepts to, to Chinese medicine. So I won't spend any time identifying uh, identifying them. But they 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 modeled themselves on yin and yang, heaven and earth. They followed the cycles. They didn't eat too much. They didn't drink too much. They went to bed when it was appropriate. They worked when it was appropriate, and they rested when it was appropriate. So you know. People, people were just in, you know, on some level, they just follow, they were part of nature, which of course, for, for, for us as, as modern Western humans, uh, we are very divorced from nature in our, in, in just our lifestyle, in our culture, you know, all of these things like, uh, you know, in like uh, incandescent lighting and, um, uh, air conditioners and heaters, and we can all we can sort of manage this kind of baseline all the time, which is not how heaven and earth respond. Th th there are cycles of of chi, specifically yin and yang chi, in heaven and earth. Of course, now speaking um, toward the the um, early part of January, we've gotten past the winter solstice. So now we're at the part where the yang chi, although the yin chi is still dominant, the yang chi is starting to rise. And so the sages were aware of these things. And that's basically what um, Qi Bo tells Huang Di. Back in the day, people just knew how to live properly. They didn't have to try. They were just, it just, you know, that's on some level, that's the Tao. Like you're, if you're part of the Tao, then you're one with heaven and earth. And, you hold yin and yang in your hands and all these very poetic metaphors. So Chibo goes and basically tells these stories about, about the sages, and then he gets into what's going wrong today. Again, today meaning 2,000 years ago, but equally appropriate to, to us. And he says that the problem is today people drink too much. Um, they sort of allow themselves to behave in ways that are perverse in, in some mention, not necessarily, you know, I know that term has sexual connotations, but not necessarily that just, you know, like a perversion of the Tao maybe would be a better way to say that they get drunk and then they, they enter the bedroom. Um, and this is where we get to the, the, the first point that I really wanted to touch on, which is when, by doing these things, by living out of harmony, eating and drinking without regularity, uh, having sex when it's inappropriate, they squander their jing. Okay, so they, they squander this thing that, that, that we're talking about. And so that, that gives us a good sense of how we can help our, our patients or, or, or on some level what we're being instructed to do not just for our patients, but in our own lives as Chinese medicine practitioners, which, which is, you know, not easy, <laughs> even for, you know, for those of us who, who would discuss these things and read about them and, and spend time. And um, I'll just continue a little bit more in the passage, but there's a mention of um, the spirit. And we're going to see as we go on a little bit later, there, there's a very strong connection between the the jing and the shen or this or often translated as spirit but as elizabeth rochat uh, de la Valle points out in her work um this is a yin yang pair just like 
when we see shui qi, blood and qi, that's a yin yang pair as well. So is jing and shen. Um, and so that's important to, to, to keep in mind because, of course, um, that gets us back to where it all goes, which is yin and yang in, in heaven and earth and these things. So um, what we get from, from this passage is the notion that desire is, is a problem. It's, it's not just that, that we're out of harmony, but the way that we get out of harmony is desire. Um, and that, of course, brings us to concepts that um, parallel very closely Taoism, which, which perhaps we'll, we'll talk about later on. Um, but I, I, I took a commentary from Zhang Jiebin on one particular line in this passage. And just, again, for, for those of your viewers who may not know Zhang Jiebin, he was... Um, an, an author and commentator and practitioner uh, that lived at the end of the Ming Dynasty, and he he wrote what is considered to be one of the greatest commentaries on the on the Neijing, which is called the Lei Jing, um, or I think it's usually translated as like codified classic or something like that. Um, but he he had a commentary on this one particular line that I thought was very appropriate. Um, and the line that we're talking about again from the Suwen is. Through desire, they exhaust their jing. Through being wasteful or wastefulness, they scatter their jun, um, which is generally accepted to be the true qi. Um, we talk about jun qi in Chinese medicine. So what, what did Zhang Jiebin, who's also known as Zhang Jingyue, say about this? He said, desire must not be encouraged. When desire is encouraged, the jing will become exhausted. The jing must not become exhausted because when it is exhausted, then the jun qi scatters. He also says, jing can engender qi, and qi can engender shen. And then finally, he concludes by saying, thus to be good at nourishing one's life, which is the term that you are no doubt familiar with, yang sheng, um, one must treasure their jing. When jing is abundant, qi is exuberant. When qi is exuberant, the shen is complete. The shen is preserved. When shen is complete or preserved, the body is healthy. When the body is healthy, diseases are few. When the shen and qi are solid and strong, one can still be robust in old age. All of this is rooted in jing. So what do we have there that we can take away clinically? We've got you know, a treasure trove there of, of information that on some level is extremely practical, but on the other hand, as I said from the outset, is, is a little bit tricky. Because um, how do we do this? How do we ourselves do this, embody this, so that we can be an example for our patients, and so that we can encourage them to follow this information from the Neijing? And I, you know, that's why I chose to start talking about Su in chapter one, because, you know, it's, it's such a fundamental understanding of health. And it all, it, it's, the suin is very clear and these commentaries are very clear. It's, yeah, it's desire and all these things, but at the root, it's about preserving one's jinn. Um, yeah, so I'll just continue on a little bit with suin one. Well, one of the comments that I, you know, I was thinking about when you were talking a little bit while back was that even the cycles are, like we talk about climate change, even the normal cycles even if we shut off all of our electricity and went to go live in the woods, even our normal cycles are no longer the same. We can't get food that hasn't been polluted or the GMOs are being carried by the wind, you know, all over the place. So it's like, um, it, 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 it's a huge challenge to right. live up to those things now. Yes. Yes. I know um, one of our um, mutual friends, colleagues and teachers, Zev Rosenberg is of course working on um, some material about that. And, um, the, the, the person who taught me uh, the Neijing and the classics, um, he, he, he goes by his American name, which is Kevin Zhu, but his Chinese name is Yan Zhang. He, he said once, um, and you know, this sort of ties back into your notion of um, climate change. He was talking about our uh, sort of uh, uh, obsession with fossil fuels. And he said, you know, what are the fossil fuels? The fossil fuels are the Jing of the earth. Mm -hmm. We're extracting this jing of the earth 
and burning it. And by doing so, we're creating this sort of young pathology within our environment, um, which you know we refer to as climate change or global warming or what have you. Um, so, so yes, indeed, like as as time goes on, we're being increasingly challenged to to live in this in this way. I'm sorry, I cut you off. You were going to start with a really cool topic there. So go ahead. Oh, no, no problem at all. Um, so Sue in chapter one, um, we'll just keep going a little bit. The, the and, and, and the reason why I, I wanted to continue on with Sue in chapter one, and we'll, we'll look at a couple other passages as well, just to, to kind of flush out our understanding um, for, for your viewers. But this is, is the follow, you know, you can see and hopefully your, your audience can also notice there's a progression here about what we're talking about in Sue Wen. So Chibo continues on and he's saying, um, and here I'm, I'm gonna use Unschuld's translation. So those of your uh, viewers who are interested can always go along, they can follow along, they'll know what I'm talking about. Um, that's that's a, a very well done academic translation. So Unschuld says, quiet peacefulness, absolute emptiness, the true chi follows these states. When essence and spirit, again, Jing and Shen, are guarded internally, where could a disease come from? Hence, the mind is relaxed and one has few desires. The heart is at peace and one is not in fear. The physical appearance is taxed, but one is not tired. The chi follows its appropriate course, and from that, there's compliance everything that one wishes for one achieves um i like that that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> you know I, so 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 on some level that hopefully that would be the answer when people say ah oh, it's really hard to i just don't want to go to bed at like nine o'clock in december well if you do then you have that to look forward to so you know hopefully that that is, that is a, a good plug for following these cycles and so I, I brought in a commentary now from one of Zhang Jiebin, uh, one of his students. And the name of this student is Zhang Jertsong. And he was writing during the Qing Dynasty, so immediately right after his teacher. And I really liked what he had to say about this because I think it ties into a lot of stuff that you're gonna that you talk about, that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so he's 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 defining this term. He starts off by defining this term that Unschuld translates as quiet peacefulness. Um, when I look at the Chinese, if I were to translate the characters specific, like very literally, I would translate it as tranquil and indifferent. But I think Unschuld's translation, quiet peacefulness, carries along that notion. But Zhang Song says uh, this, this term, quiet peacefulness, is Wu Wei, which those of your viewers who are familiar with um, Taoism, uh, specifically uh, the Tao Te Ching, are, are no doubt familiar with this term. It's, you know, people write you know, a doctoral thesis on how to translate this term, but, you know, it's usually translated as like actionless inaction or action without action, something like that, doing without doing. Um, so, so Zhang Jir Song is saying, this notion of quiet peacefulness is Wu Wei. And he says then, therefore the Zhe, um, which is usually translated as will and associated with the kidney, um, is relaxed or leisurely and desires are few. The Jing Shen is guarded within. Therefore the heart is quiet and without fear and the form labors but does not tire. The Jun Shi follows it. Therefore, the qi follows and complies with it, meaning the, the jing shen. Um, and then he just sort of paraphrases the rest about, you know, as a result, people have, you know, clothes and food and they're happy. But I, I wanted to isolate this term, which I mentioned before, jing shen, because we see this a lot. And this is a term that is... Um, is seen not just in in the Suwen, but also in a number of philosophical texts that either predate the, the Suwen or are roughly contemporary to it. 
Um, and so we'll look at some of those translations of Ying Chen as well. Um, the, the most obvious one, um, again, Elizabeth Rashad de La Valle has done a book um, about Huainanza chapter seven, which the name of the chapter is actually Jing Shen. So it's an entire chapter about this notion of Jing Shen. Um, but I just want to continue on with Suen chapter one, which is just to sort of wrap up here, um, because it's it's sort of this, it, it'll it'll kind of wrap it up in a neat and tidy little package. We've we've seen how the sages were, we've seen how we've deviated, and now we're gonna sort of get the the summary. So Chibo is gonna say again here, um, following Unshold, hence the sages or the people of antiquity considered their food delicious. They accepted their clothes and they enjoyed the common things. Those of higher and lower status did not long for each other. So the people who were at the bottom of society didn't try to reach the top and you know vice versa. So things were natural. Cravings and desires could not tax their eyes. Excess evil could not confuse their hearts. The ignorant and the knowledgeable, the exemplary and the non-exemplary, none was in fear of other beings. Hence, they were one with the, the way, which of course is the Tao, that by which the, and this is the reason why they were able to exceed their lifespan of 100 years without weakening. Um, and the reason for that, uh, it says specifically, is their virtue was perfect. Um, and so this gets us now to some ideas from the Tao Te Ching. Um, if you're familiar with the Tao Te Ching, people um, that are, are watching may be familiar with the Tao Te Ching as well. One, one of the most famous books, um, it, probably the most famous book of Chinese philosophy. Um, but there, there's a chapter, chapter 12, um, which, which this notion, this, this final paragraph really reminds me of, which is the five colors blind the eye, the five tones deafen the ear, the five flavors dull the taste, racing and hunting madden the mind, precious things lead one astray. Therefore, the sage is guided by what he feels and not what he sees. He lets go of that and chooses this. I mean, that there seems to be a very strong parallel here between what is said in Suan chapter one and this particular quote from, from Tao Te Ching. Um, and and I, you know, I just pulled out a couple other quick uh, quotes from Tao Te Ching. Here's one from chapter 16. Empty yourself of everything, let the mind become still. And then chapter 19, it is more important to see the simplicity, to realize one's true nature, which there would be Jun, um, to cast off selfishness and temper desire. So it's, it's very clear when we look at this Suen chapter one, that, and, and particularly with regard to um, your own uh, area of interest of Yangsheng, of, of what that really means, um, what this in, this introductory paragraph or introductory section of the Suan chapter one is really talking about, which is letting go of desires, not being desirous of things, because it's that desire that um, we'll see later in some other passages actually scatter the the the, the qi and scatter the Shen, and, 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 and that's what causes our, uh, you know, this deterioration that we see in our, in our lives um, or in the lives of our patients uh, who are not following these, these precepts. So, and that kind of ties into, um, I, I know that there was, there's always been a lot of criticism. At, you, there is now, and there's always been, I guess, since the Han Dynasty and before of this kind of um, pursuit of, perfecting the body is not enough. So nurturing life, if you're just taking it to mean fixing your physical body, you're not going to really get anywhere. You're gonna be very limited. So the idea of, of Jing Shen and tying it to these other um, less physical um, aspects of ourselves, because if those aren't reined in and then we're gonna dissipate our Jing anyway, right? And, and that's, that's it's it's given equal weight um, in terms of, of yangshen, in terms of cultivation, in terms of making yourselves healthy. Yes, um, yes. Um, well, well 
observed and, and well summarized there. Um, I, I agree. And you know, this is this is where we get into a territory that is very confusing to a lot of um, Western practitioners, which is we see parallels between the ideas in Chinese medicine and certain ideas that we associate with Taoism. Certainly looking at that passage from Suan chapter one, it doesn't take a great leap of faith or logic to say, well, you know, that that kind of sounds similar to Tao Te Ching chapter 12 about, you know, being happy with your food and, you know, not desiring things. It, it, there seems to be a parallel there. And I, I, I think this is something that scholars and teachers need to be very aware of is just because something looks Taoist does not necessarily make it so. Um, and, you know, we may talk about that a little bit later. Um, well, I'd actually love to talk about that because that's something that I've been kind of pondering myself and I don't, I, I feel a little bit confused about because I, I'm kind of, I had an interesting mix of a background. I went to a Taoist lineage school. I had TCM teachers from China and, and then I did my doctoral program, which was much more um, westernized. And so I feel like, okay, I feel like it's all kind of one <laughs> big yeah. um, ball together. So what what is this separation between Taoism and Chinese medicine. What is Taoism and what is Chinese medicine? <laughs> well, well, uh, it's a little question, just a little, very simple question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll cheat a little bit and, and just quote back um, Tao Te Ching chapter one, the Tao that can be named is not the true Tao. Um, so, but the, the distinction that I would make and um, I would point your um, viewers who may be interested in this notion um, or this discussion, uh, I would point them out to Louis Comjathy, who actually is a professor at University of San Diego. And on his website, if you Google um, common misconceptions of Taoism, you'll find a PDF that he produced, which is very nice and short and pithy. Um, he basically gives you like the common misperception and then what is actually true. Um, and so without getting too far into it, um, because this is, as we sort of joked, a, a fairly complex topic, um, again, we are being English-speaking Westerners trying to learn Chinese medicine. And I would, I would also specify trying to learn TCM. Um, we are, you know, culturally removed so many steps. Like, you know, we can't most, as I said before, many of us cannot read Chinese. Um, uh, we did not grow up in Chinese culture. Um, we, uh, so we're not familiar with these ideas. Like, you know, we don't have, most of us don't have a background in Chinese philosophy, Taoism, Confucianism, um, these things that have shaped the foundation of Chinese culture for millennia. We, we're already so far removed and to make matters worse, we are, we are learning a system, TCM, which as, as you're well aware, um, is a modern version of Chinese medicine that has, has really only been around for less than a hundred years. So, and, and as I used to tell my students when I was teaching in the master's program, the, the class that I was teaching was actually the first class on the first day of the program. And I used to kind of go off for, for about an hour and just kind of share my ideas and, 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 and thoughts with them. And one of the things was the way that we get Chinese medicine in the West, the way that it's taught to us, the, the way that we receive it is is as this monolithic block and you know it's really hard to parse what is what is what <laughs> I, I mean when it comes down to it so you know this is a major challenge for us 
Um, and you know, one of the things that I always sort of joke about is I'm fairly certain that well over 99% of the practitioners in China who are practicing could name the Chinese dynasties in succession and could tell you some famous Chinese doctors and the books that they wrote and the, and the formulas that they composed. And, you know, that's not, I, I don't mean that to sound like a diss on Westerners. We just simply have to work a little bit harder to bring ourselves up to speed from where a, a native Chinese learner would be, would be approaching this TCM, because make no mistake, TCM is what's being taught in China as well. So, the, you know, they're still getting this modern, modern um, approach by and large. One of the, the challenges here, um, specifically related to Taoism, is, and, and I would say to Confucianism as well, is the, the terminology. And this is one of the things that Kumjathi in this um, brief little chart that I mentioned that you can get on the web uh, says is, he, he quotes, this is the misperception that ideas like qi and wuxing, um, which is the five elements or the five agents or five phases, whichever you prefer, um, and qi are, and the word Tao are Taoist concepts that, that are in Chinese medicine. No, these are concepts that are shared by, like, they, these are root concepts of China. Of China. Like, they, they, they aren't specific to one system. Certainly, the Taoists talk about the Tao. They talk about yin and yang. Confucius talks about the Tao, and he talks about yin and yang. He talks about desire, um, you know, and, and stilling one's heart you know, stealing these these desires, stealing the spirit, all these things. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now. Um, there, there's pl there's plenty more we could discuss on that topic, but yeah, the, and I, the, I think one of the things that's confusing too, what that was to, is that is that we want dichotomy in our culture. We want firm lines of you are you a Christian or are you a Muslim or are you a whatever, and then it's like, but if you talk. You know, if you go to China, if you talk to Chinese people, people or or how many of us have other religions and are Buddhist? And are, there's because because Buddhism and Taoism, Confucianism, they're not exclusive, and so people can be all three of them, or one of them, or two of them. And and there's there's this fluidity about it. I think that in the West is not we don't relate to because we like to have a team. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and we're not comfortable with paradox especially with our current culture right now, it's more so. But um, so I think that's another thing that confuses it further is that um, we want to make it very um, compartmentalized. And even within Taoism, there's so many different schools and uh, masters fighting with each other to the death about different topics. So um, I, I think it's very difficult to define the, the, the parameters of, of Taoism, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, we can certainly say there are, we, we can identify texts that played a major role in Taoism, mm -hmm. like Tao Te Ching, which we've quoted. And then actually, I also pulled in a quote from um, Zhuangzi chapter four, kind of getting back to this idea of, you know, stilling the heart, stilling desires. Th there's, there's a term in, in Zhuangzi chapter four which is uh, Xinjai. And again, my, my pronunciation is not very good, but what that translates to is the fasting of the heart. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just take a moment here since we're on the topic to discuss another thing that uh, you can find on, on um, Lewis Comjathy's chart, which is um, that the Tao Te Ching is a Taoist text. It, it's, it's, that's a very complicated notion um, because there, there's an understanding of the Tao Te Ching which shaped Taoism to a large degree. And, and same with, with Zhuangzi, 
like it, it would be foolish to say these texts had no no bearing on 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 Taoism. But mm -hmm. Kumjathi, at least my interpretation of what he's saying is, well, we can't necessarily distinguish them as holy Taoists. Um, there's there's concepts that when we look at the growth of Taoism, there are certainly concepts that are in there um, that that have been part of Taoism. Um, you, you know, this idea of fast, the, the fasting of the heart. Um, of course, some of the concepts in Tao Te Ching would would play roles in the precepts of Taoism, and you know, the, the ways to distinguish. Uh, somebody practicing maybe the true Tao uh, versus the false Tao. Like, you know, what are those things? Well, the Tao Te Ching is pretty clear, and the Taoists took these ideas or um, they, they incorporated them or these ideas are incorporated into Taoism that, you know, you should be humble. Um, you know, we see that throughout the Tao Te Ching. There's that famous passage, I forget what chapter it is, but, you know, the highest virtue is like water because it, it flows downward, so it 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 basically lowers itself it, below everything else, and as a result, all things return to it, or all things flow to it. You know that is a a a, a precept of how a Taoist should behave. Um, and there there's another very famous um, passage from Zhuangzi that that when you read it, um, if a Westerner were to read it. Uh, it might not, it, it might seem kind of nice and philosophical, but it's actually very specific. Um, it, it played a role in later Taoist meditation, which is, um, and again, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about my chapters here, but yeah, Zhuangzi, there's, there's a, a quote where he talks about um, Hundun, which is like the primordial chaos. And there's, there's a boy and a girl. And they see Hundun, and they notice that unlike human beings, Hundun doesn't have any orifices. So they say, "Let's make Hundun more like a human being." So they, you know, create eyes for Hundun and a mouth and ears. And and basically, what happens is by the end of the time that they're done with, you know, creating holes in Hundun, they, it's the Hundun is dead. And what, but what is that really about? This is taking us back to what we've been talking about this whole time, which is closing the eyes, closing the ears, closing the mouth. This is about meditation. Like, you know, when you open, when, when you're opening your eyes and when you're listening and, and when, you know, you're desiring things and, and all of this, you, you're divorced from your true, your trueness. Um, to a degree. And so, you know, again, these, these ideas play a part, but, but I would, you know, always refer back to Kumjathi, and there's some other scholars as well. Um, Michael Sasso, who um, was Professor um, Emeritus at University of Hawaii, um, he talks about these ideas as well, that, that basically we should not be lulled into the idea that everything that sounds Taoist to our Western ears is necessarily Dallas. Um, so I suppose I'll leave it at that for okay. now. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so did you, I didn't want to interrupt you if you already have a, a track that you're on right now, or do you have a question? I can probably incorporate, you know, the, the good news is all this knowledge is so, you know, it's coming from the Su Wen, so it's all so philosophical that it's fairly easy to work in, in any sort of angle. Okay, about. great. You know. um, well, I, I guess I'm always curious because um, we all learn all of this information. How do you try to modify this so that people actually will do it in your practice? Well, I think probably the best piece of advice that I ever got um, on this is from the late Alex Tabiri. And for those of you who don't know, Alex Tabiri was a very beloved practitioner, one of the founders of PCOM San Diego, um, and, and well-known uh, particularly for his acumen with pediatrics. And what he said was, 
When you want to get your patient to make a modification, the best way to do that is not to tell them, you have to cut out gluten completely from your diet evermore, because <laughs> that's what people hear. Or you, wanna, you have to cut out sugar from your diet evermore. What, what he said was, try to get them, again, gauging your patient, try to get them to commit to a small time frame that seems manageable. So, you know, let's say you're saying, seeing a patient once every week or so. They come in, you're, you're looking at them and, and, and you're, you identify that one of the, pro let's just take a generic example. Let's say somebody has insomnia and we say, we do our usual investigation and inquiry and we, we come to this point where we realize, well, they're doing a number of things. They're um, eating too late at night. They're, um, you know, maybe staying up on Facebook uh, and so right before they go to bed or they're on their phone right before they go to bed and they don't go to bed till, you know, somewhere between 11 and 1. So we want to modify that behavior according to Chinese medicine principles. So we say, well, you know, it'd be ideal if you could get in bed, you know, between maybe 9 and 10. Do you think for the next week you could stop your electronic use, um, you know, make sure that you're no longer on Facebook or on your phone, and after 7 p.m., you don't eat after 7, and try to get to bed between 9 and 10. Do you think you could do that for a week? Um, and that was uh, Alex Tiberi's notion, was get them to commit to the small thing, because if they do, then they will see that it's beneficial to them. And then the next time they come in, you say, were you able to um, do that for, for the week? And, you know, Let's be realistic here. Probably most folks will say, you know, uh, I didn't do it for you know the first night, but then I, you know, tried it and you know, maybe they were on again, off again, or maybe you're lucky and you had an amazingly compliant patient who did it. And then you say, okay, well, can we do it for another week? Like, are you feeling good? Um, you know, have you noticed that you've been sleeping better? Oh, actually, come to think of it, yeah, that night that I did go to bed. I slept really soundly and I wasn't tired when I woke up. Like, you know, that that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I tend to follow that same sort of example in my own practice. I thought that was really great advice from him. And, you know, I, I certainly can't come up with anything that's, that's uh, more profound than that. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, very nice. And how would you define Yangshan? Hmm. That is, a challenging thing to say. I, in all honesty, I mean, Sheng is of course life, but life and birth and generation, all these things. Um, I, I think nourishing life is accept, is is a fairly good translation. I, I, I stayed away from talking about the Ma Wang Dui manuscripts. But I think those of your listeners who are interested, I would suggest looking at Donald Harper's translation. He did a book called Early Chinese Medicine, um, which is his translation of the Ma Wangdui medical manuscripts in particular. And there's a whole section there on Yangshan and those sort of practices. Um, you know, a, a quick definition I would use, I would probably just steal from, from Suen chapter one and say, it's it's about limiting your desires and um, serving Jing. Okay. And, Fair enough. You know, um, <laughs> well, uh, and and I I pulled in a couple quotes um, from a few other passages in the Nei Jing that I thought might be instructive to help fill out our idea of Jing. Um, and one of them is from Suan Chapter Five. Now Suan Chapter Five has always been for me like th the one chapter when. As you know, I did when I, when I was a doctoral student at PCOM, like yourself, I um, I did my doctoral research on the Neijing. And so people would always ask me, oh, you know, you're all into the classics, you're into the Neijing, like, what, what should I, what, you know, what do you think I should read? I don't have, t I don't have time, what should I do? And I'd always tell them, just keep rereading Suen chapter five. Because to me, Suen chapter five pretty much summarizes 
everything you need to know about Chinese medicine. Oh like, wow! Okay, <laughs> that's all I have to read. Yang, Taoism, or the Tao, like maintaining harmony. Um, it talks about the 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 you know the qi, the temperature of herbs, and the flavor of herbs. It just it's so deep. So Suan chapter five is always my go-to chapter um, whenever anybody is like. Eh, I don't really have the time to devote to the classics. What's the easy way? I always tell them so in chapter five. So there, there's an interesting quote in there which says, and, and this is my translation, so it's not necessarily perfect, but, um, oh, no, this, actually I used Unschuld's translation to make it easy. Um, chi turns to essence. Essence turns to transformation. Essence is nourished by chi. So chi turns into jing. Jing turns into transformation. Jing is nourished by qi. So there's there's this sort of give and take between the, the qi and the jing. And then there's this also this other interesting thing. Transformation generates jing. So there's another close pairing between jing and transformation. And then it says later on, jing transforms into qi. Um, and I, and I chose here a quote, again, the commentary from Zhang Zhezong, the Qing Dynasty commentator, on this specific line, Jing transforms to become Qi. And what he said was, Jing is the root of Yuan Qi. So Qi is the transformation of Jing. And I think that's, that's, that's really a great um, way to think about it. Um, I, I thought that was a very good way to describe it, and, and hopefully that notion of or that strong connection between uh, the Jing and Yuan Qi will um, resonate with you know some of some of your your audience, um, and so the, the the other passage, the last passage I wanted to talk about um, is actually not from the Su Wen; it's from the Ling Shu. But I think this is possibly even. It's right up there. I would put it right on the same level as as what we talked about with Su in chapter one, because um, it's 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 something that I think when we listen to it and we understand it again, it tells us very clearly how we can manage our own lives, um, how we can help our patients. And um, this would be my translation here. Um, so the jur, the will, and the yi, which is typically translated as thought or intention or intellect. It's the, the spirit of the spleen, right? Um, are that which drive the Jing Shen. Um, and I made a note here, the, the, the um, word they use for drive is like, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's like the person, it, the ability to be at the reins of a chariot. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the, it's the will and the thought that are sort of the charioteer of the the Jing Shen. They it, they gather the Hun and the Po, and they act in accordance with cold and warmth and harmonize joy and anger. So now we're getting some more almost instructions for how to nourish life from a, a psycho emotional perspective. Mm -hmm. um, the jur and the will. Um, uh, Zhang Jiebin in the Lei Jing makes a note here when it says acting in accordance with cold and warmth. Um, he says, you know, he, he translates that as, or he, he likens that to two other characters, which would be regulate and mediate. So regulating that cold and warmth, which of course then gets us right back to yin and yang. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then it continues on here. Uh, Ling Shu chapter 47, when the jur, the will, again, and yi, the thought, intention, and intellect, are harmonious, the Jing Shen are concentrated and straight. Um, you, you know, it's not the same word as Jung, it's not upright, but straight, um, you know, it, it's sort of hard to translate. The Hun and Po do not scatter, regret and anger do not arise, and the five Zong do not receive evil. So there we have something very similar to what we saw in chapter one. When we get this will and the thoughts, when we, when we can curb this desire and concentrate ourselves 
kind of inwardly and pull all of that back in, that the Jing Shan are concentrated, the Hun and the Po don't scatter. And so the emotions specifically related to anger and regret don't come up. And as a result, the five Zong organs um, cannot receive evil. Um, and, you know, like, wow, <laughs> like that is so uh, important for, for us as practitioners. You know, you know when, when, when people ask me, uh, you know, those of us who are, are into the, the classics and really base our practice on the classics or kind of, um, I suppose, would be in the, in the, in the group that would lament sort of the, the, um, the focus on, in many uh, schools, on integration without teaching the classics. Um, th those of us who, who fall into that are often challenged by the question, well, how are the classics relevant to my practice? And so I give you this and I say, how is this not relevant? <laughs> how is telling somebody that, and, you know, even if you were just to quote this, that by curbing your desire and keeping your thoughts and desires sort of contained, um, how is how is that not clinically relevant? Of course it's clinically relevant. It's so clinically relevant that we almost take it for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and same with Suan chapter one. It's something that we, we, it seems like we're taking it for granted. Like, oh yeah, of course you want to live in harmony with the natural cycles. Everybody knows that it's Chinese medicine. Like, well, okay, but how many of us as practitioners are actually doing that? How many of us are encouraging our patients to do that? Not easier said than done. Um, <laughs> so th that, that was sort of my, um, those were the quotes that I wanted to pull out of the Neijing. Mm -hmm. And then just to give people some additional background on this concept, because we've seen it appear multiple times. And again, as I, as I noted, Elizabeth Rochat um, did a book called Jingshan. Um, which is her translation and commentary on Huainanza chapter seven. Um, there's also a very good translation of Huainanza chapter seven by uh, John Major. Um, those of your audience who are interested in Chinese medicine and Chinese philosophy, I would definitely recommend that. Um, specifically because it's a text that is roughly contemporary to the Neijing, um, as, uh, excuse me, the Suwen in particular. And so we see a lot of parallel concepts, be, and there's even some speculation that some of the same scribes that were um, working on Huainanza were also maybe working on the Neijing. So mm -hmm. I, I pulled out um, a, a few choice quotes from uh, Huainanza 7 to specifically discuss Jing Shen because we hear that term and it, it, it you know, probably sets off little tiny blips about, okay, Jing, and I know what Jing is, and I know what Shen is, but but what is that compound term? So let, let's see what they thought about it. Um, so this is what Huainanza chapter seven says. The Jing Shen is what we receive from heaven. The physical body is what we are given by earth. The sages model themselves on heaven. Again, very similar to Suan chapter one there. Accord with their their Jun, their genuine responses, are not confined by custom or seduced by others. They take heaven as their father, earth as their mother, yin and yang as warp, the four seasons as weft. Now, that strongly parallels a number of ideas that we see in the Su Wen, specifically these notions about um, heaven and earth as father and mother, yin and yang as father and mother, the four seasons as the transformations of yin and yang. Um, or the manifestations of yin and yang. And then it says, for this reason, those who seek the Tao externally will lose it internally, which I think goes right back to, and again, just to be clear, I, I'm not saying this passage influenced another passage. I'm merely pointing out parallel passages, um, which, which suggest to me, if nothing else, that these notions, because remember, and this is something worth, I think, I haven't mentioned before, but is worth mentioning that the people that were writing these ancient texts were, number one, they were literate. They were 
oftentimes associated with the imperial court. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they were the literati, they were the scholars, they were familiar with these ideas. Um, they would have undoubtedly been familiar with Tao Te Ching, I Ching, all of these notions, um, all these books they would have known. Um, so it's worth knowing that um, and, and sort of saying that. So th they, in my opinion, there's a lot of allu allusions to things because they recognize they're, they're, you know, they're writing for their time period. It's like, if you've ever seen that funny video that people have taken, I, I think you and I are roughly the same generation. Mm -hmm. So we probably, you probably had a Walkman at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So if you've ever seen those videos where the kids are like, they give it to like today's youth, you know, which is only what, like 30 years or so, like, after the invention of the Walkman, and they give them tapes in the Walkman, and they try to figure out how to use them. Like that's only thirty years past. But like, if we, if someone were writing back in the eighties and they wrote something about like, you know, so and so had his Walkman with him, two thousand years from now, we may have no concept for what that is. Right. My point, my point, of course, is that they are when they write, they often take certain things for granted. As I said. Uh, from the outset, Suan chapter one, the very first few lines are just a very brief description of Huang Di. Why? Because all you need to do is kind of remind people who Huang Di was, because they've heard of him. There's folk tales about him and all this other stuff. So, you know, I, I think that's worth keeping in mind. And then um, just to finish up here with Huang Nanzi chapter seven, it says, uh, the Jing Shen, how can one expect it to course through the body for long periods without respite? So, you know, and 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 then the, the the final quote from this that I thought was very appropriate to Chinese medicine um, and the way that we think about Chinese medicine. Again, here, Huainanzi, chapter seven. Therefore, the blood and qi are the flowering of humankind, and the five zong are the jing of humankind. If blood and qi are concentrated within the five zong, and jing shen does not flow out then the chest and belly are replete and lusts and desires are eliminated. When the chest and belly are replete and lust and desires are eliminated, then the ears and eyes are clear and the hearing and vision are acute. The apertures of perception, which in Chinese medicine we often, it's the same term that we translate as orifices, are the portals of Jing Shen. When the eyes and ears are enticed by the joys of sound and color, then the five zong will oscillate and not be stable. When the five zong oscillate and are not stable, then the blood and qi are agitated and not at rest. When the qi and blood are agitated and not at rest, then the jing shen comes out and is not preserved. Um, that is, you know, I, I think on some level, that's an even better description from this philosophical book than what we're getting from our own medical works like you know of, of course i sort of arranged my my different quotes so they could sort of lead into one another but as you've no doubt noticed there's there's an interesting thing here that we don't necessarily um associate with uh, necessarily in chinese medicine which is the idea that the orifices are portals for the jing shen and the reason why uh, if we were to extrapolate, the reason why in, in Tao Te Ching, the five colors blind the eye and the five tones deafen the ear is because they basically call that Jing Shen out from the eyes and out from the ears, and we're sort of spilling it like through our orifices. Of course, we, we spill Jing at, through our lower orifices as well, um, which is a big part of... Um, you know, so, something worth worth mentioning, um, again, going back to Suen chapter one and th the way that we conceptualize um, men and women, um, specifically with regard to the Jing, um, you know, there, there is this notion, but in, in Chinese medicine, the way that, that I was taught um, by my classics teacher, um, and I think this quote comes, uh, I always default to Suen chapter five if I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's Suen chapter five, but there's, th there's a quote that, the clear yang is what fills the upper orifices. So, and 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 that the vision is is clear and the hearing is clear because we've got 
clear yang in the upper orifices. And when you get turbid yin up there, that's when you know, you, you've got a, a, a chi perversion because the clear yang is supposed to go up, the turbid yin is supposed to come down. If you have turbid yin up there, then your vision is messed up, you can't hear as well. Um, but it's interesting here that the way that it's described is not clear yang, but jing shen. Mm -hmm. um, so I, again, I just wanted to, to point that out um, just, you know, for, 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 for those of your audience who, who may be interested in practitioners of Chinese medicine, just you know, some something worth thinking about. But I, but I love that that notion about you know the these thoughts and desires um, causing the the zong to oscillate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the I think there was another passage I was looking at somewhere else that was, you know, I think it was actually the Shang R commentary to the to the Tao Te Ching, um, which talked about the the um, the the zong vibrating like the string of a lute um or of course you know the chinese name for a lute they just translated it into english but mm -hmm. um since i brought up uh shang R commentary i i pulled a couple of things from there um which I, I think is also instructive for our overall understanding which is people should accumulate meritorious actions so that their jing shen communicate with heaven um, and then later it says, Jing congeals to form Shen. If you desire to keep your Shen from perishing, you should congeal your Jing and maintain it. Um, Jing is a variant form of the Qi of the Tao. It enters the human body as the root and the source. Um, so th that's sort of my exposition on Jing. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's plenty more. Um, I, I just sort of picked and chose things that I thought would be um, appropriate to, you know, both practitioners who had a familiar with Chinese medicine and, and, and people, like persons who might just sort of be interested in these notions um, or, or people that are into Chinese philosophy, um, you know, hopefully that, that, that will give a better idea of, of, of Jing and, and this notion of Jing Shen and how we can kind of mediate that uh, in Chinese medicine. That was wonderful. No, it, it's really interesting to me how someone could think to practice Chinese medicine without studying the classics and having, I mean, for me, it's not only just being able to practice better, but it's all, it's the fun of discussing, well, what does this mean to you? No, I don't agree with that. Or let's, you know, and all of that. I mean, that's, that's the real, I mean, that's what Chinese medicine has been. It's like these centuries of kind of, debating and trying things out and all of that. And so you can't have a living medicine if you don't have that history to, to go back to. Um, so I think that's a very sad, um, I think integration, integrative medicine is, you know, it's, it's, we're adapting to our society and, and there's good and bad to that, but you have to have that core in what you're teaching. You have to have that part. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I agree. I when I, when I first proposed the idea of my doctoral research, one of the um, the, the criticisms that I got, or, or or the challenge of it was, um, because uh, just for for clarification, my, my my research was particular to um, teaching uh, the Nanjing to master's level students, creating mm -hmm. basically a curriculum for master's level students, um, and one of the challenges that I got was. Well, there's quotes from the classics in, uh, you know, Giovanni's book, and there's quotes from the classics in, you know, Chinese acupuncture and moxibustion. <laughs> um, wh why should we have, you know, classes specific to uh, the Neijing or Shang Hanlun or, or what have you? And, you, you know, you, you raise a very good point, which is something, of course, that, that we see debated in a lot of forums um, nowadays. Um, and I think often those of us who uh, sort of revere the classics are somewhat misunderstood in terms of what we're actually saying, which is we get it, <laughs> or, you know, and I don't want to speak to everyone, but so I'll, I'll, I'll say I, I get it. Integrative medicine is a juggernaut that is rolling forward, whether we like it or not, in America. And we need and, and will undoubtedly those of us who want to practice Chinese medicine, or if you prefer East Asian medicine in America, are going to have to figure out 
how to work within that paradigm, yes. The, the thing that I think gets misunderstood when people like myself, um, people like our, um, you know, our mutual teacher and friend Zev Rosenberg um, try to defend classical knowledge or say students need to be taught this information. Um, I think what people miss is that we're not saying they need to be taught this information in lieu of integrative medicine. No, we're saying you need this information so you can have a strong foundation so that we can actually do this integrative thing. Like, and, and, and that's one of the challenges. This is what, you know, wh when, I, when I have students um, or, you know, uh, I'm on a forum or something and people are, are talking about this stuff, one of the things that I think gets missed is there's a terrible misconception. And, and I think this is, I think particular to the Western and maybe even the American student which says, I have a master's degree in Chinese medicine, therefore I know Chinese medicine. No, you don't. If you do, tell me the dynasties and name 10 famous Chinese doctors. Like this, this, this and, and I, I'm, I'm being sort of facetious here and, 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 and you know, to illustrate the point, but the idea is <laughs> there is so much depth. The idea that you could understand Chinese medicine in four years, um, is is ludicrous so and and you know the interesting thing that i came across in my own research was um because i was in order to build this curriculum i was interviewing my selection criteria for the survey was they the people i was surveying had to be teaching the naging in some capacity at the master's level and so um one of the things that was interesting was I was asking them, what do you think are the 10 most important chapters in the Neijing for master's level students to know? Um, and one of the, the, some of the pushback that I got was, well, it's hard to, you know, whittle the Neijing down to 10, 10 chapters. It's such an important book. Other people said, well, like, I don't even know if I can, you know, if I understand the Neijing well enough to be able to make that judgment call. And what I, what, what I always responded to them was if we don't do something, they won't get anything. Exactly. Like, That's true. If, you know, we can't be held back by the notion of, well, if you really want to teach the Neijing, you have to teach all 162 chapters. Like, no, that's not reasonable. But, but, what, I'm, but what we can expect is that we can whittle it down to, these are 10 really important chapters. Obviously, the Neijing is a huge book that shouldn't be whittled down to 10 chapters. But if we have to, if, if our choice is the students know these 10 chapters well, or they know nothing, then we have to choose the former option, in my opinion. Right. And well, and not only that, but if, if they learn that and they see the practical application, they're going to want to read the rest on their own. They're, they're going to be interested in having CUs on the rest. You know, they're going to exactly. explore that. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, can, we can give them the tools. Um, we can give them, and, and hopefully we can give them enough of a, a background and a context so that they can look at the Neijing and if they choose to continue on on their own, they, they have some understanding and they're not drawing conclusions that are culturally biased. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then just to, to, to wrap up my point about the classics, if we are going to integrate, the important thing to do, in my opinion, is to integrate, the integration should come between true masters of Chinese medicine and true masters of Western medicine. That should be how we work. We sit down at the table together. I don't try to, you know, pretend I know your system. You don't try to pretend you know my system, but we respect each other. Like, although, you know, the Western MD may have heard of yin and yang. Um, <laughs> um, it always gets when I hear yang, I'm like, oh, <laughs> it does something. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's definitely one. Um, um, but, and, and you know, I, I may be able to rattle off some neurotransmitters or some hormones or whatever, but just because I, I can, I know a little bit doesn't mean I know Western medicine. Just because they know a little bit doesn't mean they know Chinese medicine. And, and so I feel that it's a mistake 
to do what many schools are currently doing now, which is to try to create this integrative practitioner who knows some Chinese medicine and some Western medicine um, and doesn't have the context behind the Chinese medicine. Um, you know, as, as you know, you've no doubt spoken to at Zev and, and seen other people talking about people that are interested in this notion. If you say, well, Dr. Garrison, you don't know what you're talking about, like, whatever, I would encourage you to read Neither Donkey Nor Horse. Um, it's very clear in that book how, and, and it's very interesting and it's instructive to us in the West because it, it breaks down some of the challenges that the practitioners of, of Chinese medicine in China were facing when there was a push toward modernization and when biomedicine, Western biomedicine became like the new thing. But so, so you see these interesting debates that unfold and some of the sacrifices that the Chinese medicine practitioners had to make in order because they were afraid that if they didn't acquiesce some things, they would lose the ability to practice completely. Um, and so, you know, that's something that's that's also instructive to us, I believe, in the West. And, you know, th the more sound we can be on these theories, like, my God, we've spent, what, an hour and a half talking about Jing? Right, like, exactly. Can we talk much more, yeah, it's just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and like if 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 we cast all that aside and say, well, ah, whatever, then aging belongs in a museum. That's the only thing that's you it's useful for. You then said we that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get them on the show. <laughs> <laughs> that would that would be an interesting debate. Yeah, um, both of you. I would like you and that person on the show. <laughs> I, I think there there's a worthy panel discussion for sure. Um, <laughs> But th this notion that even something as simple as following the cycles, you know, mediating our desires for things on the outside, you know, um, for, you know, um, certainly the idea of lust is something that comes into you know, the desire, the aging is sort of, on, on some level, one could argue there's, it's, it's written more for, for a, a male audience, but the desire for, for a woman, um, which, and, and everything that that entails it is on some level, if you're not, you know, keeping it sort of, if you're not keeping that desire, at least, and this is my interpretation, but if you're not keeping that desire sort of authentic, um, or if you're not keeping to the trueness of who you are, then, you will, among, I, I mean, I would extrapolate, you will attract somebody that is not um, for your highest, you know, benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, through that desire, which leads to um, the physical realm, you will end up exhausting your jing as well. Um, and and, and uh, I, I, I didn't spend, you know, really any time mentioning it, but I think it is worth noting that when you look at Suen chapter one after that section that I spent time on, where we're talking about the ancient sages and how they did this and how people have gone wrong, there's a section that I know you're very familiar with, um, which is about what I sort of colloquially, colloquially refer to as like the cycles of seven and eight, um, where you know, you've got women on cycles of seven, and then you've got male on cycles of eight, and there's a whole description. The interesting thing I noticed when I looked back on that passage is that the word Jing only appears in the sections on man, men. Oh, really? I yes. never, okay, that's fascinating. Okay. So you'll you'll see both of them talk about kidney chi, um, mm -hmm. both for both men and women. But if you actually look at it, the only time Jing is mentioned is with regard to men. And it, there's there's actually a, a quote, um, I don't know, maybe I actually put it in. Um, oh yeah, I did, I put it in just in case. Um, so just as a contrast, at, at the, the second round of things, so at two sevens for women, which mm -hmm. is 14 years old, 
the Tianguay arrives. And you could we could spend another hour and a half talking about what Tianguay is, so I won't. But uh, Tianguay arrives, the Ren Mai, which we, those practitioners are familiar, Ren Mai, is open, and Tai Chong Mai, meaning the Chong Mai, uh, seemingly, is exuberant, and the menses descend at certain times. Actually, that word menses literally would translate to something like monthly affair. Um, and, and then it says, thus she can have a child. If we look as a parallel, if we look at what it says for men, look how this is, is similar but different. At two eights or 16, the kidney chi is exuberant, Tian Gui arrives, so again, we, something similar there. Jing Qi overflows and drains, and yin and yang are harmonious, thus the man can have a child. Um, and, it, and I didn't put any more in there because I thought that was the most interesting mm -hmm. example yeah, um, yeah. as a parallel, but um, you also see uh, as men age, one of the things you see is that they're losing Jing. Um, Whereas when you look at what it says for women, what, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're fam more familiar with this maybe than I am, so feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the discussion focuses, of course, again, on kidney chi, which we talked about, um, which is sort of the, the, um, the grand equalizer between men and women, mm -hmm. but also the Yang Ming channel, right, yes. is what we see in, in, in women's quote-unquote deterioration there's that horrible line that everybody, you know, I know it's horrible. <laughs> about like the Yang Ming becomes deficient and the face is scorched or withered or something horrible. Um, it, but so you have the, you, when, when it's talking about women's aging, you see that most of the discussion focuses on Yang Ming, the Ren and the Chong, mm -hmm. whereas um, the male aging, primarily talks about kidney chi, and then it gets into um, kind of the liver and the tendons and um, uh, the, the, the jing. So just something I wanted to point out there, um, just for curiosity, because I know that's a topic that you're very well versed in. Oh, and I'm very interested in. I actually, so if you go, if you look just at, the, at that passage, then there isn't a lot of um, it's not really supporting this idea that Jing is in the menstrual blood or there's a connection there. Is that correct? Because that's something that there's a lot of debate about. Um, again, going back to what is Jing, where is it located in men and women? And so there is, um, the, there is, a, there is a, a long history of taking care of self-care during menstruation and during childbearing because that's when women lose their Jing. But where is that really... I guess my question is in the classics. There's definitely that cultural behavior. Right. I personally, I would, this might be considered cheating. <laughs> okay. little, yeah. I, would, I would say <laughs> that the best answer I could give is that it's a very much wrapped up in Tian Gui. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's an, uh, and one of the reasons why I know this is I'm going to be talking about this in my um, Neijing class in just a few weeks. But there's a quote from Fu Qing Ju, who I'm sure you're very well aware of. Um, I believe he was Qing Dynasty, maybe possibly Ming, but he was um, one of a very famous practitioner that wrote his book. Uh, I think it's Fu Qing Ju Nu Ke, which would mean just Fu Qing's book on uh, you know caring for women or something like that, um, or, or or how to treat women, and. He has a very interesting passage in there. If you haven't seen it, it's, I would definitely, it's worth looking at. Um, and it's, it's again in this funny question and answer thing, but the question is, according to Neijing Su in chapter one, at, at age 49, seven times seven or seven sevens, a woman's menstruation will cease. Mm -hmm. How come sometimes the um, menstruation will cease before that. And Fu Qingju gets into this whole discussion about Tian Gui, which I think is very interesting, um, which he basically makes the case that Tian Gui means heavenly water. Um, that's sort of been something commentators have talked about for a long time. Tian means heaven. Gui mm -hmm. is one of the stems associated with um, the, the water 
phase or element. Um, so Tian Gui, it's often how it's translated. But Fu Qingju basically says, nowadays people say Tian Gui, they talk about Tian Gui, but they claim that it's a, a def, um, basically blood withering that's bringing on this uh, early cease to menstruation. So, and, and he sort of, and I, I don't have it in front of me, so I'm going completely off memory here, but he basically says, um, these people say the word Tian Gui, but they don't take a moment to actually ponder what that word means. Mm -hmm. Why would they call it Tian Gui if it was all about blood? Why wouldn't they call it, you know, um, why wouldn't they call the menses uh, Jing Shui, uh, uh, meaning, uh, you know, menstrual blood, um, right. as opposed to the term that's usually used, which is Jing Shui, again, sort of a, <laughs> they sound the same when I say them because of my tones, but one is Jing Shui, X-U-E, meaning blood. Mm -hmm. The other is Shui, S-H-U-I, meaning water. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why would they call it the heavenly water or the menstrual water if it was purely blood? Right. Um, so I, I thought that was very interesting. So th that's sort of my answer is, is it all goes back to Tian Gui because what the, the, the common denominator between these two passages it, um, of when we're at uh, Suman chapter one, we're at eight, eight, the, the second cycle for men and women, both of them, the Tian Gui arrives. Mm -hmm. And again, here with women, it, it, the, the arrival of Tian Gui is associated with Ren Mai and Chong Mai opening and being exuberant. So we can make some then, you know, here we go again on another 30 minute thing. But like, <laughs> You can make some uh, um, extrapolations based on what we know about Chinese medicine, right? So Ch uh, Chiang Mai uh, is connected to this this notion of fertility. Okay? Um, the points of uh, you know Chiang Mai is referred to as the Sea of Blood mm -hmm. in, in the Ling Shu as well. Um, and the points to access the Sea of Blood are on the Yangming channel, specifically yeah. the foot Yangming, the stomach channel, meaning stomach 37, stomach 39. Those are specific points for accessing the Chong. We also know that Yangming is the channel that is most abundant in Qi and blood. So we see this very interesting thing where it, it, that seems to indicate certainly that something about the, the the menstruation being lost, being connected to the debilitate over over time, the debilitation of the Chiang Mai, the debilitation of Yang Ni. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is definitely a component, I would say, based on those readings, in my opinion, there's an there's an, a component where they wreck like I don't think they're saying menstruation is not blood, but I think what they're saying is menstruation is just, uh, blood is just one component yes. of this thing that we call Tian Gui. Mm -hmm. And likely, if we're going to follow, you know, then going back to what it says for men, okay, if if when the Tian Gui arrives, that signals the Jing Qi overflowing and basically the man's ability to, you know, in this sense, ejaculate and produce a child, whereas the, the menstrual cycle for women signifies their fertility now they can have a child um theoretically of course um you know th there seems to be a, a, a i would say there's there's a definite correlation there between tian gui and jing even if it isn't necessarily spill spelled outright um, yeah, right. but you know again someone might come along and say i'm completely off base there but you know based on 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 my understanding that's that's the best uh, answer that i could come up with for your question okay and i mean that's the fun part that we can Someone can come in and argue and say it's all ridiculous, and then we get to, you know, talk back and forth. It makes it fun, um, but it makes sense to me. So, and then you have an opportunity, and here's where we can 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 tie in some integrative medicine stuff. Okay, okay. <laughs> then, then, you know, you can, you could look up, for instance, um, what what the West considers to be the composition of of menstrual blood. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, what do you find out? That it's not only blood. <laughs> that there's more than just blood. Um, so 
there we have that you know that the Chinese were were on it like right. you know <laughs> there it is that's you know there's Tan Gui right there um it's not just blood um which you know is seems fairly simplistic but you know that's to me that's an example of how understanding Chinese medicine mm -hmm. we can uh, participate in the discussion with Western medicine without necessarily turning our back on our own system or causing Chinese medicine to become subservient to Western medicine, which is or biomedicine, which I think is really the 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 thing that practitioners who value the classics are feeling right now is the only way that we can get a seat at the table is if we sort of kowtow to Western medicine and like, okay, you're the experts and we're just sort of this, you know, bastard stepchild or something. Right. <laughs> well, and I mean, but the problem with that is at that point we lose our competitive edge because then you don't have to go through all that schooling just to become a technician. I mean, what makes Chinese medicine so difficult is the theory and the diagnostics. If you are just someone who's throwing, you know, putting needles into someone, and we still have to take some time to make sure you don't kill anybody, but you don't have to, it's not as hard. And and I mean, that at that point, what's the difference between us and dry needlers? You know, it's just like, there's no difference. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. You, you hit the nail on the head there with, you know, sort of what's happening right now, at least what's causing the most buzz within the acupuncture community. Certainly it's that. And, and of course the grand irony of that, in my opinion, is that is directly related to our or the community's overall desire to become integrative. We, right, right. We say like, oh yeah, we've got these, you know, we now have the biological mechanisms behind acupuncture. We can identify the following biomarkers for acupuncture. And then the West says, well, thank you very much. Now we'll, we'll utilize your therapy and- Exactly, exactly. Anymore. Um, see, it was all just, um, you know, psycho, or pseudo, scientific mumbo jumbo like and 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 but ironically the answer to why people should not be practicing dry needling is also in the classics oh really look, <laughs> i mean <Sure. laughs> you, you look at um certain chapters like later chapters in the sioux when like which are very um practical um and they talk about and and it appears again in the ling shu this notion of when you're needling, when your intention is to needle at the level of the yin, don't go beyond it. When the, when your intention is to needle at the level of flesh, don't go beyond it. it you know, and and it's very clear about you know, but there, there's there's just so much there um, in, in the classics about how to practice, how to do these techniques. The idea that any of these techniques are somehow new is just coming out of really just ignorance and you know you know if if I were to try to really politicize the the issue I I think a case could be made for um let's be kind and say unconscious racism this idea that the the Chinese ancient Chinese don't know they just made up the silly system based on yin and yang and like you know, we've now perfected it in the West, mm -hmm. and this is how we're going to do it. How how is that not a you know? Let's maybe a better term might be culturally elitist perspective. Um, so, I, I would encourage anybody, <laughs> since we're talking about dry needling, I would encourage anybody who is really fighting the dry needling fight, read the later chapters of the Su Wen, beginning maybe with Su Wen chapter thirty. Look at some of the chapters on needling in the Ling Shu, because you will see there. Um, that the techniques are very important and you will find everything you need to know to combat this ridiculous notion that somehow what they're doing is like beyond acupuncture or you know, the <laughs> next evolution of acupuncture. Right. Well, I mean, the next evolution <laughs> of acupuncture wouldn't cause pneumothorax and all these <laughs> things that are happening. So I... I yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's why we got to go back to the classics. You know, when you're needling the flesh, don't needle into the organ. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's that's sort of um, you know what I have had about Jing there. Mm -hmm.
Um, you know, and, and you mentioned Taoism. I pulled in a couple of things. You know, should you want to talk about Taoism? But I know it's it's sort of been a long ride. Um, yeah. But you're you're welcome to. Uh, I'm happy to talk if you know if if. I you think want. I'd love to have you back. I think this is probably because I'm ready to ask you some other questions and go on these tangents. But probably we should close for for our fun. one topic, which you know yeah. always goes off. But um, I just wanted to end with, because I, I really feel grateful you're doing a great service to our profession. And I'm so happy to have teachers like you out there um, teaching this stuff to, to new practitioners. Um, is there anything that you would like to say in closing about Jing or about you know anything at all to our viewers? Is there any message you'd like to leave them with? Sure. Um, I think we've spent a long time talking about Jing um, and Obviously, there's a lot of discourse that's happened in the thousands of years of Chinese medicine and truthfully, Chinese culture um, that we can use to understand Jing. But really, when you come down to it, the classics are very clear about the role that Jing plays in human health. And so I would, I would suggest that really at its core, what we're talking about here is limiting desire or at least recognizing that with unlimited desire your chances of living a long and healthy life go down um so that would be sort of my practical advice um i would echo your sentiments back and say likewise i'm grateful that you are out there teaching and, and, and doing what you're doing, um, educating people. I think the, you know, the, the students of Chinese medicine and East Asian medicine can only be as good as their teachers. Um, and so we should strive to be the best teachers that we can be. Um, we, we should strive to um, incorporate the deepest understanding of the classics um, as possible. Um, even for those who are not necessarily excited about the classics, uh, I think having some familiarity with them, um, and I would suggest here again, sort of my Phil, Dr. Phil's cheat sheet here on the on the Naging, the Cliff Notes version is read Suwen chapters one through nine, um, read Ling Xu chapter one and chapter eight. Um, if th those would be probably some of the most important chapters. Um, what translation? Because there's tons of translations. Which translation? Oh, well, I, that's always a tricky question because as uh, someone who leans more towards scholarship, um, I would go to the Unschuld translation, but I also recognize that it's two volumes, it's heavy, it's hard to carry around, it's expensive. Um, so for practitioners that are not necessarily excited, or, you know, don't really want to make the commitment um, to investing in the Unschuld, truthfully, the one I suggest, um, which I will qualify here um, in a moment, is Mao Xingyi's translation, um, which he did. It's I, I suggest it for a number of reasons. One, it's cheap. You can get it for, you know, probably eight bucks used. I think I got mine for 12 at Moe's Books up at Ber up in Berkeley. Um, it's easy to read as well. Um, and the one caveat with that edition, which he says straight out in the translator's preface, is that he's included his own commentary into the text without delineating it as such. So the, the one problem, the glaring problem with Mao Xingyi's translation, as I see it, is that you'll often see people quote from the Neijing in their blogs or other things, and you realize they've actually pulled what, they, what they're quoting is a little bit of Su Wen and then a whole bunch of commentary. <laughs> yes. Um, so I would, I would qualify it with that. But if you want a, a cheap, easy to read translation, Mao Xingyi's translation is, is um, again, with all the academic caveats in mind, is the one I would suggest. Mm -hmm. um, there's only one translation really um, available uh, that's sort of portable and inexpensive of the Ling Shu, 
which is the one by Jing Nguyen Wu. Uh, I may have it here. Oh, here it is. Um, it's this one. Uh, but that one, again, it has some translational errors. He's who I was thinking of when I said people translate Jing as seminal essence. Mm -hmm. So he takes a very modern translation. But again, this is for somebody that has a cursory understanding and just wants to sort of get their feet wet a little bit. Those are the ones I would suggest. If you're a serious academic, well, you probably know this already, but the unshulled translation of the Suen and his forthcoming translation of the Ling Shu would be the ones that I would recommend. Um, yeah, and then just uh, again, like this is, you know, this, we are at a time, in my opinion, this is totally my opinion, but we're in a time uh, in Chinese medicine in America where we are on the verge of, I believe, a major schism. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And uh, one that is going to drive two different types of scholars um, and practitioners. There is the, the one side that are going to follow the classics, that are gonna to continue to get interested. I see more and more people, new students every day getting interested in translation. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. We need that. Teachers, we need that. Um, you know, I, I, I believe that in the next 20 years, to teach Chinese medicine without a knowledge of, a, even, a, even a rudimentary understanding of, of uh, Chinese language, you'll, I, I believe those teachers will become obsolete. Um, I, I, I think we're moving in a direction where we have seen such a heightening of the the academic what's available even in English you know that's yeah. why I tell people all the time people are like oh I don't have time to you know learn classical Chinese in order to read the classics and understand this like that's all in you know in my mind that's that's something that is sort of in the mind of people that well the only way I could really understand the Neijing is if I read it in the you know Han Dynasty Chinese or technically the Tang Dynasty Chinese because we don't have a version from the Han. Right. But you know if I read it back you know if I could read it in the original then I'd really know it. But since I can't then I won't because I won't understand it at all. Nonsense. Of course you can get something out of it. Will your understanding be a little bit deeper if you can understand Chinese language? Certainly, without a doubt. You can read it. You can look at the characters. You can analyze the characters. You can look at commentary. All that stuff is very important, but to not even try because of this perceived roadblock that is something that is in the consciousness that I've heard teachers say um, to their students, other people, um, you know, this notion that, well, you can't really understand the classics unless you learn Chinese. I am strongly opposed to that notion. There is a wealth of research um, on Chinese philosophy, Chinese religion, um, the medical classics, Chinese medical history, available in English. Yeah. Like, the, and, and, and we need to, the other thing that I always stress to people is, we, at, nowadays most people know how to PubMed search. Well, that's one aspect of what we do. You also have to be able to go to the university library and do a scholarly search yeah. on Wang Di, on Taoism on you want to talk about yin and yang? I guarantee there's like a scholarly paper on yin and yang. There's probably hundreds of them, yeah. you know, in English. <laughs> so, you know, I always tell people start in English. And then if you get really excited and you decide, well, I really want to take the next step, then you can start learning Chinese or you can learn it concurrently. But don't let that dissuade you. Um, and so that is for the people that are interested in the classics that might get held back. That's my advice. The okay. people that want to go the integrative route, I support you. I understand where you're coming from as well. And don't get me wrong. When I teach, even if I'm if I te if I'm teaching Shang Han Lun, if I'm teaching Jing Gui, I pull in in addition to the commentaries and whatnot that I'm using. I will pull in Western research on this formula and say, yeah. See, here's the Western research on it, um, because I think we do have to be literate in that mm -hmm. sense. But I would encourage you over there on the integrative side, whoever you are, like learn the classics too, because your ability to integrate will be so much greater if you do that. 
Um, and I would encourage the classical minded people to not lose sight of, you know, keeping up with some of the modern research about things that you're interested in. If you're an herbalist, look at some of the research on um, uh, pharmacology of the herbs. Like, you know, and again, I would say, don't let that be your guide for how to use the herbs, but let it be a supplement, um, almost like a modern commentary right. on, on how the herbs could be used. Because, it, you know, as I used to tell my Herbs One students all the time, to say that I use Yin Chao or Gan Mao Ling in my practice for the common cold because the common cold is a virus and therefore I use these formulas with antiviral herbs. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, that would be an accurate statement, but look at how many Chinese herbs have antibiotic and antiviral right. properties. Right. Right. Like, there's lots and lots of them. The, the, the herbs in Jingfang Baidusan, which is, you know, of more of a formula for wind cold, has a lot of antibiotic, antiviral herbs in there as well. So don't let that guide your practice, but right, right. you can use that information to supplement if, for instance, you know what formula you want to give, you know you need a modification, and maybe you're torn between two or three different herbs, then you might, and, and you're having trouble deciding from a TCM perspective, then the, that Western pharmacological biomedicine perspective might really benefit what you're doing. Um, right. Because you can say, well, the, you've already chosen the herbs, and then you're trying to narrow it down based on this other information. I think that's a reasonable way to practice herbs. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I don't think, you, you know, and, and again, this is my opinion, obviously, like, it can sound dogmatic um, if I don't really explain it. it I, I don't think you're, a person would be wrong to practice the other way. I just think it's, it, it's slightly misleading to characterize it as Chinese herbalism. Um, no, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I do. Because the thing is, you have, I think it's important is that you have to think in Chinese medical terms. Like yeah. you, your mind has to work that way. It's, it's like learning a new language. You, when you really learn it, you're stop translating it in your mind. You're thinking in that other language. Exactly. And then you can go back once you start to think in Chinese medical terms. And in order to communicate with your patients, you learn these these connections with Western medicine. In, in order to communicate with their doctors, you learn those connections. But it's not how you think when you see the patient in front of you. I think that's. The important thing, right? I mean, yes, and that's that's a wonderful summary of what I, what my long-winded response was, <laughs> which is, like, hey, you know, we all these things can be tools, but you know, Chinese medicine does have a tradition, and if we're going to identify ourselves as practitioners of Chinese medicine, I believe we need to respect that tradition. And part of the respect for that tradition is honoring that, um, knowing a little bit about the history and context of it, knowing um, how to, and and as you 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 noted, not being um, to to, it's the way. There's nothing wrong with integrative medicine, but the uh, from the perspective of a Chinese medicine practitioner, but you have to be. Uh, wise, in my opinion, about the direction you go. Like, I don't have a problem with somebody saying the Chinese concept of Wei Qi explains one aspect, or actually the better way to say it, in my opinion, would be what, what Western medicine considers to be immunity is one aspect of what the Chinese might call Wei Qi. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. But the problem that I have is when people start making one-to-one -one correlations where they say Wei Qi is uh, immunity. Like, well, to a degree, but what about Zheng Qi? Um, so <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's really important that, and, and that's what I always try to encourage in my students is, hey, I'm all for you know, trying to, to, to carry out a synthesis, but make sure you're coming from the perspective of Chinese medicine, not the other way around. Right. Um, and so that's sort of my my final thought, I suppose. Um, and it's been great talking to you. I, it's been wonderful having you. Among other things, um, I, I realize I, I talked for a long time there, but it'd be great to come back. And yeah, I have a whole 
stuff. I have a bunch of stuff on Taoism as well that I pulled in. Oh, great. Um, but yeah, um, I wish you a wonderful day and keep me posted on, on what's going on with you and where you're teaching and, and all that stuff. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Phil Garrison. Um, if you're in the San Diego area, he's also an amazing practitioner. And if you're wanting to learn from a great teacher, he's at Pacific College of Oriental Medicine in San Diego. Um, and then also online with his show and, and doing other projects as well. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you today. And hopefully we got a little smarter after this conversation. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you.